some time. And it's questions for the opposite first minister and deputy first minister. And we will start with all questions. Questions number four and five has been withdrawn. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr McGuinness. Uh, question number one, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. Thank you. The implementation of the recommendations is being overseen by a programme board which comprises representatives of the Victims and Survivors Service, the Commission, the Victims Forum and their own OFM, DFM uh, officials. An overarching implementation plan has been agreed detailing the actions and the timeframes, identifying the ownership for each recommendation, which will ensure a timely and full implementation. The programme board is providing the high level, the strategic oversight, with a specific fo focus on progress against the recommendations. And then we have a project board operating under the strategic direction of this programme board and providing with the advice on progress. The project board monitors the progress against the implementation plans through the individual work plans of recommendation owners. I mean, significant action has already been taken with over half of the recommendations either fully or partially implemented. And I think considering the short time since receipt of the report, these developments demonstrate the clear commitment from those involved to work together to ensure the necessary further improvements are made and that the recommendations are fully implemented. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and could I thank the junior minister for his answer? Uh, and could I welcome the good news that the junior minister has given to the Assembly? Uh, and of course, we'll continue to monitor the situation. But at the European Day on uh, Victims of Terrorism, a uh, constituent uh, of mine, Mr. Thomas Boswell, who had been shot by the INLA and left for dead, he said, in relation to the service, the current service, he said that it must be improved. I think everyone agrees with that. But that it should be effective, that it should be effective and practical, and that's what we want. And I ask the Minister to ensure that that is in the thinking of government. My sympathy is with your constituent and the victims of terrorism and their, and their families and those who have lost. And in fact, uh, some of the most inspirational and encouraging times I've spent in this office is going round victims, and in, both individually and in groups from Fermanagh through Belfast, right across Northern Ireland, and hearing their stories, sometimes brought together collectively for people of completely different backgrounds, and to listen to uh, their advice and also their hopes for the future and to ensure that we don't go back. But uh, the member is correct. We have 70 recommendations. Uh, 55 are from the individual reports. And a further 15 are from the commissioners that are covering the advice. Of these, ownership for 54 lies with the Victims and Survivors Service. Ownership for seven lies with OFM, DFM. DHSS PS has responsibility for two, and the remaining seven have joint ownership. In terms of improvement, 64 of the 70 recommendations are due to be implemented by the end of June 2014, with a further two to be implemented by the end of August 2014. Uh, one recommendation due to be implemented uh, by March 2015, and three are dependent on other time frames, but we expect those to be completed by the end of the year. So <laughs> these time frames have been agreed with all the responsible owners, and progress against them is being monitored monthly via the project and programme boards. I hope that gives the member some level uh, of reassurance, and I thank our staff who have been so efficient in delivering against the targets that we have set, that we are driving forward improvement and will continue to tailor meet the service to meet the needs of victims and survivors. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, no, no one doubts the sort of direction or the intention of this particular piece of work, but would the Minister agree with me, given the, sort of the length and the number of, of recommendations, perhaps, that the, the knowledge, the skills and the experience of some of the officials perhaps isn't as appropriate as what it should be? Well, we have listened very carefully to 
both victims individually, we've listened to the organisations uh, that represent them, and we have listened to the victims commissioner uh, in terms of the report that has been brought forward. It's uh, an evolutionary process. We're getting better at it as we go along. The more we listen, the more of an evidence base that we gather. We set up the project board, uh, the program board. We've got the project board working towards it. I have to say, um, when the recommendations are many, but the needs of victims are many, and I think the progress that has been made in such a short period of time, after the analysis, responding to the evidence of need, has been very constructive and very helpful. And my last contacts uh, with both individual victims and victims groups um, have expressed praise for our own officials uh, who, have, who have reacted so quickly to the recommendations. And the fact that, as the member will know, people, you know, people will not believe what you say, but they will believe what you do. And the fact is, for many victims and survivor service, they have seen the recommendations, they have heard our commitment to do it, but they are actually seeing, as I have outlined earlier, our delivery on the ground against those recommendations and our target for meeting the others. So I think we are generally on a positive trajectory with the victims and survivors sector. Tom Elliott. Mr Elliott. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the uh, junior minister <coughs> for that update. And the comprehensive detail about uh, the figures of recommendations. He did indicate that I think it was three recommendations that they hope to have implemented before the end of the year. Can the junior minister detail what those three recommendations are and why there is the delay in them? And has it anything to do with the, 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 the proposal of the board to advise the Victims and Survivors Service? I, I'm not sure towards the end of the proposal uh, of the board and uh, it's extremely difficult um, to break down uh, each of the 70 recommendations. I've set them out uh, as best that I can. I'm not picking up that there are any difficulties uh, with the board. Um, I'm also very pleased, as I said, to the OFM-DFM committee uh, at the time that we have victim representation uh, that is there. Um, we are very serious about matching each of these recommendations. We have taken ownership of it. We have uh, detailed them specifically down to a department. Um, OFM DFM has stepped up the plate in terms of what is ours. Um, and we have been very clear on what is shared. And the only way you can go against a series of recommendations, or the best way to deliver for victims and survivors, is when you have the recommendations, that you have listened to the service, and then you strategically put in place measures to address each of those recommendations. You also put a plan against which they can be measured against um, and resources necessary from government to ensure that they're achievable within a realistic time frame. We have done each and every one of those and on any individual recommendation of those 70 that I've spoken about, if any member wishes to write to the office, we will reply to them to let them know because we have a project board examining against each. And I think one of the successes of uh, devolution, if I may say so, is that if we take the position we were in when we were under direct rule, and if we take the service that we are providing today, it is significantly enhanced, both in the, the quantity of the services being provided on the ground, but also in the financial capital that's being provided. In many ways, for some victims, we can never make things right, and we know that. They have lost a loved one. But we are determined to do all in our power to ensure what we can get right, we will get right. William Humphrey. Mr. Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the junior minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the junior minister, what are his plans for the recruitment of a new victims commissioner for Northern Ireland? Well, firstly, um, can I put, uh, re echo the words of the first minister and the deputy first minister uh, in relation to the sterling work um, that Catherine Stone. Uh, gave uh, to the service. And it is a difficult and complex uh, task that she undertook. And listening, listening to the victims and survivors respond back to how they were treated, the sensitivity that uh, she gave to the subject, uh, the way she applied herself to the task, um, and the integrity with which she delivered so much uh, within her period. Uh, I want that uh, echoed and written into the record. 
Um, there's been a considerable development uh, in the sector, particularly the recent independent assessment of the Victims and Survivors Service. And we are committed to ensuring that the advice and recommendations that were brought to us by Catherine are implemented. So a new recruitment uh, process uh, will be initiated as soon as possible to appoint a new commissioner uh, for victims and survivors. And uh, we would like to thank Catherine again and put into the record of this House our thanks for her work. David McNary. Mr. McNary. Question two. Mr. Speaker, as uh, members will be aware, the Minister of Finance and Personnel has already informed the Assembly of the financial consequences arising from further delay in progress on welfare reform. To help address this pressure, he suggested a 1.5% cut to all departmental baseline resource budgets for 2014-15. This will be entirely and ultimately a decision for the Executive. The Executive has not yet taken any decision on this matter. The Executive may indeed decide to protect one or more departments from any such cuts, and therefore the cut from other budgets would be greater. The Department is currently assessing the range of actions required to manage within a reduced 2014-15 resource Dell baseline budget. These potential actions include reduction to all baseline business areas, including arm's length bodies. Difficult decisions will have to be made, but in considering the way forward, we will seek as far as possible to minimise the impact on delivery of frontline services. David McNary. Mr. McNary. Uh, Speaker, I, I appreciate the, the, the grim uh, aspect of the uh, First Minister's answer, and my supplementary accordingly would be that uh, has the good ship executive hit the rocks over this issue? Uh, can we be told or expect that the choppy waters uh, between the First Minister and the Deputy are to be, be calmed. Or really, are we being positioned for budget reductions all round because penalties uh, will be prioritised instead of programmes? And finally, I am asking him to give an assurance that all will be done uh, to, to, to see that we are talking about salvage, salvaging a situation, not salvaging a shipwreck over this issue. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the member, first of all, that I think we have to recognise that in any coalition, much more the case when it's a mandatory coalition, uh, people come from very different uh, ideological backgrounds. Uh, and it's uh, not unnatural that there are differences between parties and the, the executive. That will always be the case, and sometimes the, the press feign surprise uh, at this, but uh, it's not unusual that people should have a, a different uh, approach. Uh, of course, we will obviously have to sit down and try and resolve these matters. Quite simply, the money runs out, uh, and we have to, to deal with it, and we, we can't simply be left in circumstances where our permanent secretaries, who are the accounting officers for departments, uh, are forced to take uh, decisions and uh, seek directions. Uh, as far as the, the executive is concerned, I trust that the, the executive can sit down uh, look at the penalties which have already begun. We have already had £13 million taken out of our budget for this year. There is another £87 million to be taken out during the rest of this year. Uh, it will be a uh, £1 billion over the next five years. You simply cannot ignore and close your eyes to the consequences of that. It will have a, an impact on the services that we have, and we need to take the decisions that are necessary. By far, in my view, the best decision to, to take uh, is to accept that uh, the enhanced package that has been uh, proposed uh, by DSD and is before the uh, executive should be approved. That would have a better deal uh, for those uh, who are requiring uh, assistance on, on welfare than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. Gregory Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the First Minister, uh, is he aware that I had a written response from Danny Alexander of the Treasury just before Easter recess, which pointed out some of the stats that, that the First Minister has just alluded to. Uh, and given, uh, given the very clear implications that that will have for our budget, can he be any more specific in terms of the possible consequences for ongoing failure to implement welfare reform? Well, I mean, I think we have to be candid. We are facing a 
nightmare scenario. Uh, not just the figures that I, I gave to the, the member for Strangford, but uh, in addition to that, we have the very serious issue of computerization. Uh, the figures given by DSD would indicate that uh, the cost of the new computer system that would be required uh, if we are to continue with the, the present uh, arrangements will cost well over a billion pounds. So that's a billion pounds in capital, a billion in revenue over the next uh, five years, loss of jobs in the Northwest, uh, undoubtedly probably about 14 or 1,500 jobs uh, for those who are already servicing uh, welfare reform uh, and welfare payments uh, in GB. Uh, and on top of that, of course, is that uh, the computer system will be switched off uh, during the, the course of 2016. Uh, so unless our new system was up by then, and everybody in IT tells me that there is no chance of the new system being ready by then, it would require us to make manual payments, or no payments, and I think that's probably unacceptable. Uh, if manual payments uh, are required, then you're talking about increasing the staff uh, at all the, the offices. Michaela Boy. Can I thank the Minister for his response thus far? Does the Minister agree that the Executive has a responsibility uh, in terms of protecting the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in our society in line with Programme for Government commitments? Yes, uh, I do, and uh, I believe that the, the Executive uh, will be the envy of the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, when they see that uh, we have been able to negotiate uh, twice monthly uh, payments, they split payments uh, so that one or other par partner can receive them, direct payments to landlords, and the recent package, of course, which deals with joint claims, it sets up a £6 million uh, fund to provide payments on, uh, on, uh, for medical reports. It uh, proposes a contingency fund uh, to deal with the, the hardest cases of about uh, £30 million, uh, and of course uh, it does not apply the bedroom tax to Northern Ireland for all of uh, the sitting tenants. Dolores Kelly, Mrs Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, First Minister, on more than one occasion you have referred to an agreement that you and the Deputy First Minister had agreed around the implementation of welfare reform. Perhaps you could inform the House of what the, the terms of that agreement were and what, what were the sticking points on it? And well, Mr. Speaker, so that we can be absolutely clear, uh, we have a, a process, and uh, I want to, to keep that process, where while we have discussions, uh, and those discussions will reach a conclusion, we never have an agreement until the parties uh, come back after they have considered them uh, at a party stage. But the, the outline of what I have given uh, to the, the member opposite is the basis upon which uh, those discussions took place. Michael Copeland. Mr. Copeland. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, in October of 2012, the Social Development Minister, uh, Mr. McCausen, told this House that we would run out of road by March 2013 with regard to bringing forward the Welfare Reform Bill. This is now almost 12 months later. Um, can the Minister comment on what happened to that prediction? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. We are, we're starting, we are already being penalised. Uh, the Minister was absolutely right to draw it to our attention. We haven't met the uh, deadlines. The penalties have been uh, imposed. Reductions of our budget uh, have uh, commenced. They will increase year on year, uh, and we therefore have to, to face uh, up to it. Uh, of course, one of the things that I, I could never quite understand was that uh, I don't think that the Welfare Reform Bill of itself uh, should have been stopped in this uh, Assembly because, uh, of course, the details that we are talking about aren't details that go into the, the bill but go into subsequent regulations. So the, the Assembly could have passed the, the bill uh, and had continuing discussions in terms of the, the regulations. But we have run out of road. The penalties have started. They will get more severe, right to the extent of being £1 billion of penalties over the next uh, five years. Stephen Mutry. Mr Mutry. Question number three, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Delivering Social Change framework represents a new level of joined up working across government to achieve real and long lasting social benefits for those in our society who are in most need. Uh, absolutely critical to this is ministers coming together to agree common approaches to shared problems. 
Uh, that is why at the centre of delivering social change are the ministerial executive subgroup meetings. These regular meetings of key ministers set the agenda, discuss significant challenges and agreed shared actions to deliver tangible progress on the ground. The benefits of this approach are illustrated by the multi-departmental, multi-agency and multi-sectoral implementation of six key cross-cutting signature programmes. These programmes were developed within the context of the three operating priorities for delivering social change in this mandate. They provide both tangible benefits to citizens and test beds for the deployment of joined up and evidence-based policies, which will in time provide a significant influence on mainstream programme expenditure. The framework has also encouraged positive and effective working relationships between departments, leading to considerable progress being made, and we are already starting to see positive outcomes through practical delivery of these initial programmes. Looking forward, we remain committed towards the provision of a holistic approach to tackling the integrated complex and at times spiralling issues that can lead to social deprivation. Delivering social change will remain critical to achieving this goal. Mr. I thank the First Minister for his response and can I further ask him to outline how delivering social change has contributed to tackling educational underachievement? Well, Mr. Speaker, over the last number of weeks, uh, again, the issue of educational uh, underachievement, uh, particularly in the Protestant community amongst boys, has been highlighted. Uh, and of course, there are a number of initiatives contained within delivering social change uh, which uh, deal with this issue. Uh, first of all, we have recognized that uh, there is the, the parenting requirement and hubs have been uh, set up. In addition to, to that, uh, we have created posts. I think we have already got 223 teachers who are providing one-to-one -one tuition uh, for students that are, are lagging behind. And that, uh, I believe, is over 267 schools, uh, Mr. Speaker. So uh, again, the, the, the process, uh, while it is delivering on, delivering on a number of priorities, uh, is uh, attacking that, uh, that issue. But it's still an issue I think that there is much more to be done on. Call me Eastwood. Mr. Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for his answers thus far. Can I ask him uh, what engagement there's been with uh, practitioners and experienced uh, stakeholders around uh, prior to, the, to, to the, 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 the giving out of funding uh, under uh, delivering social change? Departmental uh, officials regularly uh, meet uh, stakeholders in each of the, the areas, and because this is a, a, a set of proposals, which uh, covers a wide range of departments. We expect that other departments are doing exactly the, the same thing. Uh, it's important from our point of view that not only do we have that input at the early stage, but on an ongoing basis, so that we can uh, make assessments and monitor the progress that is being made. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for his answers, in which he highlights the importance of ministers coming together and cross-departmental working. Could the First Minister give his assurances that he'll use his offices to bring together the, Deb or the Minister for Finance and Personnel and the Agricultural Minister to ensure we get the best deal in the future for single farm payment and that the decisions made in the executive and not in the courts? Well, uh, I, can, I can tell the member I've had discussions about this during the course of today already. It's a very important uh, issue. Uh, my special advisers have already been in touch with the Deputy First Minister's special advisers to, to seek uh, meeting so we can have discussions uh, on those issues. Uh, I know from those of us who are out and about uh, in present circumstances that it's a very real issue on the doorstep amongst the rural community. Cameron. Mrs. Cameron. Thank you. Question number six. Mr. Speaker, uh, our officials are currently assessing a range of actions required to manage a minimum of uh, £1 million reduction in the 2014-15 OFM-DFM resource Dell baseline budget, which is a direct consequence of our department, uh, on our department uh, of failure to implement welfare reform. These potential actions include reduction to all baseline business areas, including arm's length bodies. Difficult decisions will have to be made, but in considering the way forward, we will, as I have already said uh, today, uh, seek to minimise the impact on delivery of frontline services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank First Minister for his answer. 
Can I ask the First Minister how he proposes Executive deal with the ongoing damage caused by the fines and penalties imposed by the Treasury? Well, the, the only way that the Executive can deal with it is for the Executive to take a decision on the, the way forward. Um, I, I noticed somebody else breached the Executive Code because I, I read in the newspaper that uh, I had proposed at the last Executive meeting that the, the executive have a day specifically to deal with this uh, issue and that we look at uh, bringing in some independent authority uh, to give us uh, figures that we can all accept uh, as, as far as the consequences are concerned. It really does us no good if I put out a set of uh, figures of what the consequences are and we get a different set uh, elsewhere. We end up confusing the public, and uh, I don't think that's helpful. Far better that we get somebody independent who can look at uh, each of the, uh, the areas, what the cost to the executive is going to, to be, what the potential uh, cost is going to be if we have to have computerization brought in, uh, and then we can at least be singing off the same hymn sheet in terms of uh, what the, the uh, consequences are, and I, I hope that we will be able to reach uh, some agreement on how we deal with those consequences. Mike Maskey. Mr. Maskey. Gorm Maggot, uh, does, does the First Minister agree that the uh, Executive has already taken a number of decisions different from that which were taken in Westminster, which have had cost implications? And if that is the case, why then is it uh, not possible to treat welfare cuts on the same basis? Well, uh, of course, uh, and that should be a decision taken by the Executive if that's a decision that the Executive wants to, to take. Well, what I'm pointing out to the, the member is that uh, we are not talking about uh, tens of millions in dealing with this. We're talking about a billion pounds uh, in terms of our resource budget over the next five years and a billion pounds off our capital budget. Uh, that's far beyond what this uh, executive is capable of bearing without having very serious uh, consequences to the rest of the provisions that uh, the executive is already mandated to give. Michelle McElveen. Ms. McElveen. Is this uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. This executive's main priority is to grow the economy and to tackle disadvantage. Our department is driving the Delivering Social Change Framework to address the priority social policy areas. Seven signature programs uh, are being progressed across the departments and they're to support families, to address the barriers to learning, to improve literacy and numeracy, and to support job creation within local communities. OFM DFM is taking forward 23 social investment fund projects worth £33 million to tackle poverty, to tackle deprivation through improved community-based services and facilities. Progress is being made against the commitments in the Together Building a United Community Strategy. We have, we have approved an innovative pilot scheme for 50 young people aged 18 to 24 who are not in employment, uh, in education or training to participate in the Head Start program, which will help inform the design of the United Youth program. We are working to address the most immediate childcare needs identified during consultation. All 15 key first actions are underway, including the Bright Start School Age Childcare Grant Scheme, which aims to create or sustain up to 7,000 school age childcare places. We are also working to address the challenges of disadvantage and to tackle dis discrimination. In December, we launched a Schools Educational Resource Pack on the rights of people with disabilities. In February, we issued the Active Aging Strategy for public consultation, in addition to improving existing services to ensure they best meet the needs of older people. We have worked with departments to propose some new programs to tackle the challenges facing older people. And in addition, Mr. Speaker, we are working uh, forward the development of a new gender equality strategy and have started to see consultation on other strategies. Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further to that, that answer, could the House be provided with additional detail on the aspiration and proposed outcomes of the Community Family Support Programme? In terms of the Community Family Support Programme, which is aimed 
at people not in education, employment or training. Uh, from January to June 2013, a 26-week intervention programme supporting parents, helping young people not in education, employment or training, was successfully piloted with 44 families living in East and West Belfast, Cookstown, Straban and Newton Abbey. The pilot programme targeted 44 post-primary school families with children aged between 14 and 18 to help 88 young people re-engage with employment, education or training. Families completed short accredited training courses, work placements uh, and they were provided with one-to-one -one employment advice including CV writing and including interview technique. The, family, all, the families also engaged in debt management, stress management, healthy eating and cooking programs and confidence motivational and life coaching classes. Some of the positive outcomes from the pilot included young people returning to school to complete their GCSEs, improved school attendance and family members participating in structured training programs. An, an upscale version of the pilot was launched in November. It's currently being rolled out to 720 families. Uh, 904 participants are currently enrolled in the first cycle, 325 of which are 14 to 24 year olds. Order, members, that includes all questions to the First Minister. Uh, we now move to topical questions, and question number seven has been withdrawn. Uh, Jim Allister. Mr. Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the First Minister, as First Minister and Joint Leader of this administration, what is the impact on its credibility of the fact that the Deputy First Minister has now been identified by one of his IRA buddies, Peter Rogers, as a director of terrorism? Well, I don't think anybody in this House would be surprised, and uh, if anything, I'm surprised that the, the member uh, seems to think that this is some novel outcome that uh, has uh, been reached over the last number of days. I don't think anybody would be surprised. Indeed, uh, it has been made no secret by the Deputy First Minister of his uh, involvement uh, with the, the IRA. He gave evidence to the Savile inquiry to that uh, effect. Uh, the uh, reality, of course, is that if there is any uh, evidence that uh, he has been involved in criminal activity, then he, like any of the rest of us, should be brought before the courts and tried. Mr. Allister. The First Minister will be aware that there's quite a widespread view that under the aegis of the peace process, which these arrangements are part, that the Deputy First Minister and his party leader are in some way thought to be untouchable in regard to criminal liability. Does the First Minister agree with that perception? And as First Minister, has he made any representations to the prosecuting authorities about the pursuit of those uh, with terrorist paths? Well, I have consistently indicated uh, that uh, I, I believe that there are certain people who have been uh, left alone uh, because of their involvement with the political process that the government did not want to disturb. Uh, I drew that to the public attention most recently in relation to OTRs uh, and the royal, use of the royal prerogative of uh, mercy. Uh, however, those are, are issues which are being considered by a number of inquiries at the, the present time, uh, and no one uh, should be uh, less amenable because of their political involvement. Uh, he will know from his days in the Democratic Unionist Party that the very first principle of this party is that everybody is uh, subject to the law uh, and equally subject uh, to it. So I, I hope that the, the member will recognise that uh, all of these matters have to be dealt with by the due process of law. If anybody has uh, evidence against any member of this House, they should bring it to the uh, authorities. There are proper processes to, to go through, uh, and again, everybody should be amenable to the, the law. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Thank you very much. Can I ask the First Minister uh, if he will be complying uh, with the order of the Information Commissioner's Office to publish this week the outstanding information currently withheld on market research by Colliers International into the Peace Building and Conflict Resolution Centre? Well, Mr. Speaker, the Deputy First Minister and I will have a conversation on this uh, 
issue. But I, I think that uh, we should recognize that uh, the FOI issue is not a black and white uh, issue that everything that government uh, does should be uh, published and disclosed. Uh, we have to ensure that uh, in the public interest that government can still operate uh, effectively. Uh, and uh, there are, are clear issues where uh, within the legislation there are exemptions. Those exemptions are to uh, ensure that uh, facts and information can be given uh, to ministers uh, in a, a way that does not prejudice the, the ministers or those who provide the, the facts. Uh, and that exemption on uh, policy formulation is there. It's not unnatural, I suspect, that the information commissioner uh, might see that uh, in performing his duty, uh, the uh, onus should be on disclosure. Uh, equally, from the point of view of, of ministers, we have to be certain that in disclosing information that it is in the public interest, and that's a matter of uh, opinion, it's a matter of principle rather than a matter of law. Did the minister accept that the time to appeal has passed? on this issue and therefore the time for conversations has passed and not to publish this week would be contempt. I think the, the member is a little confused about the, the law. He might like to look at section 35 of the legislation uh, and he will see that there is what some people refer to as a ministerial veto that can be uh, exercised. Uh, whether we decide to uh, publish whether we decide to publish with redactions, whether we decide to operate under uh, Section 35 is something that we will uh, discuss. I, I would say to the, the, the member that uh, in this particular case, and there are two cases that we're dealing with uh, in FOI, uh, one relates to the risk register and the other relates to the, the, the maze. In the case of the, the maze, this is a report that uh, ministers didn't ask for, they didn't approve of, uh, they uh, had no knowledge of until uh, it had been undertaken. Uh, it's the kind of report that uh, officials carry out to, to provide the very best of information to ministers, to give ministers uh, options. And I, I believe that there are some mischievous people, perhaps even some down in that corner, who would seek to use a report that is the views of other people and associate it with the, the ministers who did not approve of it being uh, carried out. In Mr. Miller. Can I ask the Minister uh, for his assessment of the unprecedented direct attack by 27 Anglican bishops and 16 other clergy uh, who accused the Tory led coalition of creating hardship and hunger in light of welfare reform changes in Britain? Well, I, I'm responsible for many things, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, as you know. One thing I am not responsible for is the actions of the Conservative uh, Lib Dem administration uh, in GB. Uh, and uh, of course, there are people on both sides of this, uh, this argument. Uh, all I can tell uh, the, the member from the point of view of the figures for Northern Ireland, the amount of money that will be spent on welfare reform continues to increase year on year, even with welfare reform. Amen. Well, it's fair enough saying you know, that, uh, where your responsibilities lie, but uh, does the Minister not accept that the Executive has a duty and a responsibility to protect the most vulnerable against the raft of austerity uh, measures being proposed by Westminster? Yep. Uh, I do, and I, I point out to the, the member again the uh, additional steps that are being proposed here in Northern Ireland that aren't available elsewhere in the United Kingdom. What joy there would be on the British mainland uh, if uh, the bedroom tax was not to be applied to them. Uh, it would not honour the proposals that uh, we have here in Northern Ireland. Uh, what joy there would be on the British mainland if there was a fund set up to deal with uh, all the hardest uh, hit uh, people under the, the changes in welfare reform whereas we have uh, proposed a, a fund in the region of £30 million, and all of the other changes that I outlined uh, earlier. But the member has to take into account that there is not only one set of vulnerable people that we are dealing with. 
If we have to take the money away from our health budget or from other budgets, then we hit vulnerable people. We hit uh, people who are looking for new cancer drugs and will not be able to, to get them, people that are looking for hip replacements. So the, the vulnerable issue is a two-sided coin, uh, and the, the member has to recognise that there are impacts uh, on the service delivery that we have in Northern Ireland if we are to spend our money in the way that he would suggest. Sydney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, following the announcement of uh, almost 500 new jobs by the EY accountancy firm this morning, uh, which is greatly uh, welcomed, can the First Minister outline if Invest NI are meeting their targets in attracting jobs to Northern Ireland? Well, I think Invest Northern Ireland will be making uh, their, their own statement uh, next week or so. Uh, so uh, I, I'll perhaps uh, give a, a trailer of what's to come. Uh, I think they have uh, more than met uh, their targets in terms of foreign direct uh, investment. The jobs this morning, of course, were different in that they were not foreign direct investment. They were homegrown jobs. Uh, this is where the uh, management of uh, EY uh, took the initiative themselves uh, when they saw the possibility within their company uh, of setting up a, a new business unit, uh, and whereas for many people the answer was uh, India, what's the question? Uh, they changed it and turned it on its head and said the answer is Northern Ireland, and here's the skills that we have, here's the cost competitive base that we have, uh, and as a consequence we have uh, 486 jobs uh, announced today. But uh, Invest Northern Ireland uh, are, are well ahead of their, their target in terms of foreign direct investment. Sydney Anderson. I can uh, thank the First Minister for that response, but does the First Minister agree that this announcement is indeed further evidence that devolution is in fact making a significant difference when it comes to attracting jobs for the people of Northern Ireland? Yes, I think that uh, we, we probably have had a higher level of uh, jobs coming into to Northern Ireland at any time uh, in the history uh, of Northern Ireland. Uh, in fact, uh, during the course of April so far, we have had 2,000 job uh, announcements. Uh, that's a, a very considerable contribution to uh, getting the increase in our economy that we've all been looking for. Uh, and uh, as uh, the cinemas often say, there's more to come. Joanne Dobson. Mrs. Dobson. Sorry, apologies, I wasn't prepared for my question. Michaela Boyd. Uh, can I ask the Minister, um, does he believe that Giro d'Italia will be a success? Uh, yes, uh, in spite of uh, the, the, deputy, uh, the junior minister coping from his bike on uh, Saturday, uh, I don't think he'll be in the, the running line uh, for it. Uh, it's a, a massive success for, for Northern Ireland, and uh, I think that people are beginning to to get the excitement uh, of what is one of the, the great spectator sports uh, and uh, the, the sight of uh, uh, cyclists going at speeds that uh, cars go at uh, will be something that will be breathtaking for, for Northern Ireland. Uh, most important from a, a Northern Ireland perspective, of course, is the fact that uh, the, uh, the pictures will go out right across the, the, the world to about uh, 800 million people uh, having a look at uh, the Northern Ireland countryside. Uh, and of course, most important of all, starting off in East Belfast. <laughs> my uncle, can I thank the minister? And I've never saw any of the pictures of the junior minister come off his bike, but obviously he's had a speedy recovery. <laughs> can I further ask the minister, like, like other areas, it is disappointing that West Tyrone, my area, doesn't feature in the cycle route. So can I ask the minister if more can be done to encourage similar events in the future, and particularly to be located in West Tyrone and indeed in the West in the future, Gormogut? Well, yeah, I, I suspect that there could be quite a number of uh, MLAs will uh, get to their, their feet uh, and indicate that they're they regret the fact that the, the race will not go through their constituency. I can send the junior minister uh, to <laughs> Tyrone if that's any uh, help to you. Uh, but, but yes, I, I think when we're looking at sporting events, we do want to get as, as wide a spread, uh, depending on what the facilities are in various parts of the country. Question number seven has been withdrawn. Tommy Cannon's not his place. Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. May I ask the First Minister to give us an update on the judge-led inquiry on the on the runs? Uh, well, I have already met uh, with uh, Judge uh, 
Hallett, uh, and I am meeting her again next week. I understand that uh, she has been uh, interviewing uh, people within the civil service uh, and the, the police. I understand that she is looking at uh, a wide range of uh, documents, uh, and uh, I suspect that uh, the, the report will be helpful, not least to the other inquiries uh, in providing them uh, with a, an analysis of where best they might look, uh, because while the House of Commons inquiry uh, gives powers to the, uh, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee to ask for persons uh, and, and papers, unless they know who to ask for uh, and what papers they should be seeking, uh, it's a, a fairly empty power. Uh, I think the, uh, the Hallett report uh, should provide a, a lot of information that might allow them to have further interrogation of the issues. So is the First Minister content that he sh she's, not interview uh, she's not reviewing every letter, that if she doesn't find out what he wants, is he still going to put his job on the line? Can we be very clear that in, in terms of uh, uh, an inquiry, uh, I had a choice, like anybody else in this House would have if they were in my position, of whether they wanted to wait 10 years, which is how long it would take if we were to have the full public inquiry that some people in this House have been asking for. I'm not prepared to wait 10 years for an outcome. I don't believe the people of Northern Ireland are prepared to wait that length of time for an outcome. Uh, and we have, in my view, the very best of circumstances where we have a judge-led inquiry that uh, can literally has the powers to go into uh, departments, both here in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, in London, has the ability to, to go to the PSNI or to the prosecution service. Uh, and at the same time, we have two other uh, inquiries, uh, one uh, in this uh, assembly with the Justice Committee and another with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. Uh, that, I think, uh, is likely to be more long-term uh, inquiries as far as they're concerned. Uh, and uh, the, the combination of them all, I believe, can get to the truth. Order, members. That includes questions to the First Minister.